All right, first up, let's talk about the mirrorless camera design that is this camera. We have interchangeable lenses. In the lenses is an aperture, which helps control the amount of light coming through the lens. Never completely closes, just changes to allow different amounts of light into the sensor. At the image sensor, there is a shutter, actually two shutters. There's a first curtain and a second curtain that are used for controlling the exposure of the image sensor. The way it works is it needs to be fully open so that images can be sent to the LCD screen and the electronic viewfinder so that you can see and compose your images. Now, when it comes time to shoot the photo, well, there's a lot of shutter movement going on. First up, the first shutter closes so that the image sensor can prepare to capture an image. It then opens, and this is your exposure, and then the second shutter closes, and then it all needs to open again so that you can see and compose for the next shot. And this camera can do this up to 15 frames a second. And so this is using what's known as the mechanical shutter, and we'll talk a lot about mechanical and electronic shutters in upcoming sections here, but let's hold off on that for the moment. Now the shutter speed range on this camera is as wide a range as I have seen on any camera at any price, at least as far as the consumer market is concerned. Uh, we have extremely fast shutter speeds. It used to be that 4,000th or 8,000th of a second was the top shutter speed, and that's what most cameras can do mechanically, but this camera goes electronically all the way up to 180,000th of a second. I don't think it's actually very practical for most people, but it's kind of cool that it can do it. It can also go down to slow shutter speeds, even slower than 30 seconds, which we'll get to in the exposure section. But these are just the basic components of your mirrorless camera. Now, one of the most important components in any camera is the sensor itself. An important aspect of it is the sensor size. And there are lots of different cameras and there are lots of different sensor sizes. We're not gonna worry about all of them. This one uses kind of a medium large-ish one in the big scope of things. Probably the most famous one is the one that is designed after 35 millimeter film. Nothing magical about 35 millimeter film and its size. It was just a nice Goldilocks size that was convenient for a variety of reasons. And so there's a lot of cameras that have that size sensor in it. And this is known as a full frame sensor. Now what's actually in the Fuji cameras and here in the X-T5 is something known as an APS-C sensor. It's a little bit smaller in size, which means the cameras, the lenses can be a little bit smaller. Certain things are better, certain things are maybe not as good, but generally speaking, it's a very, very good balance overall for a camera for many people's uses. It's something that you can turn out professional quality photographs. It's something that you can put in a small camera and carry around with you on a regular daily basis. So it's a nice trade-off, you might say. All right, the primary controls on this camera. When you turn the camera on, the camera automatically goes through a sensor cleaning system. It's got an ultrasonic vibration which tries to knock dust off the sensor and does a pretty good job of it. It's possible that you may get something stuck on there and so there are ways of manually cleaning it if you feel comfortable and wanna get into that. We'll discuss that a little bit deeper into the class. Now this camera has a number of dials. The front dial is a command dial uh, it's something that we're going to be used for changing a variety of settings, but it is also a push button. And so it is a function button that you can program when you press in on the button. Now on the back of the camera, we have our rear command dial, and it is also a push button as well. And so they are kind of spring loaded so that you can either turn or push them for different reasons. And we'll be using those throughout the class. On the back of the camera, the four-way controller is known as the selector. This is how we're gonna be navigating the menu and all of the different options that come up uh, on the back screen of the camera. The menu and OK button, menu obviously dives into the menu, which is the second half of this class. The OK button, when you want to confirm a particular setting, it's usually gonna be that button there in the middle. The focus stick is a secondary way for controlling things. And so you can use the selector or the focusing stick for a variety of things. And so there's two different ways to navigate your way around whatever button's easier to get to, whatever feels good on your finger, it's up to you um, on what it does. Generally though, the focus stick is gonna be used for moving the focus points around. We also have touch screen on the back of the camera. So there's a variety of controls, both in shooting and in playback that you can control with the touch screen. Now, if you don't like the touch screen and it bothers you or your nose hits it and triggers things, 
you can turn it off as well so that everything is done with a physical button on the camera. Now, one of the most important things as we go throughout this class is knowing where your camera is when it comes to the still and movie option. There is a rotating collar just below the shutter speed dial. There's a little lever out in front where you can switch it back and forth. When you are in the stills mode, which is where we're going to be for most of this class, the settings in the movie menu only apply when you are recording a movie in the stills mode. And I know that sounds weird. Um, and in general, uh, it's not going to apply to most anybody right now at the beginning, because if you have the camera set up to have one of the function buttons to be a quick movie record button, well, that's what these things in the menu apply to. Most of the time, we're going to be talking about the camera in the movie mode when we're talking about movies. And when you put the camera in the movie mode, well, it expands the menu in movie options. And there's all sorts of tabs and pages in there of different things that you can control. And so if you're kind of serious about shooting movies, you definitely want to put this camera in the movie mode. Because when you see that little icon with the little movie camera and it's got one dot, that means it's the basic movie menu. And when you see the little movie icon with the three dots, that means you're in the expanded option. And generally, as I talk about the movie settings, we're going to be talking about the expanded options. Um, and that's just a way that the camera has is so that you can have the camera set up in two ways. Let's say you want to shoot really simple video, but you want to do it really quickly. You could program a button, you know, maybe the button on the front of the camera to record movies just at any time you want to start recording movies. And it does so in a basic manner. When you get serious about shooting movies, you turn the rotated collar to the movie mode and then you can have your camera set up a little bit differently for a more sophisticated movie setup. And so realize there's two different setups and we'll talk more about this in section nine when we talk about movies. All right, making sure your camera is in the stills mode right now as we go forward, because that's where we want to be. When you press halfway down on the shutter release, there's a lot of things that are going on. The camera is going to focus. It's going to turn on the metering system. If the camera was asleep, it'll wake it up. If it was somewhere in one of the menus, it's going to return you to the shooting mode. So there's a lot of things going on by that halfway press. And then pressing down all the way is firing the shutter. And so just get a feel for where that halfway position is with the dial. Now, with that shutter release button, you'll notice that it's got a little hole in it and it's got a threaded cable release option that you can screw in there. So if you like to use traditional cable releases, a mechanical threaded release, you can use that in here. There are other more sophisticated ways of electronically triggering your camera. We'll talk about that in the camera connection setting, but that's why that is shaped like that. And that's a traditional way that a lot of mechanical cameras based in, back in the film days had their shutter releases. All right, one of the most important settings on your camera, maybe the most important setting, is the file format for still images. This is your image quality. The basic options are RAW and JPEG. And so most of you are pretty familiar with the RAW and JPEG. If you're not, JPEG is a nice simple form that's great for sharing and emailing and posting on websites. All photographers work with JPEGs, but the RAW is the original image. And if you're really serious about getting the most the camera has to offer, you're probably going to want to record RAW. And sometimes you may want to record both at the same time. So when you dive in here, the first options, fine, is for a good quality JPEG image. It's going to give you 40 megapixels. It's going to be a modest file size. You can have more compression done with a normal JPEG file. And this is same resolution, but they compress the information into a smaller size file. So if you want to reduce file size, yet keep all the resolution, you have it here. You are going to be losing a little bit of image quality is it an important amount? Well, it really depends on what you're doing. For most people, it's not a huge amount, but if you are going to shoot JPEG, I would shoot fine just because it's a higher quality option and it's really not that big a file. If you want the best quality images out of the camera, you want to get RAW because that gives you the full information from the camera and it's going to allow you the most versatility in editing. You want to raise the shadows or bring the overall exposure down uh, make color adjustments. You're going to have more latitude to work with if you shoot a raw image than you are with any of the JPEGs. Now, you do also have options of raw plus JPEG. And so if you want to get two pictures, two files for every picture that you take, you can set this up as well. 
Generally, I don't recommend RAW plus JPEG for most people in most situations because once you have a RAW, you can create a JPEG anytime you want. Reasons for shooting RAW plus JPEG might be if you want RAWs for control and working later on down the road, but you or somebody else needs quick JPEGs out of the camera and you don't have time to download them into RAWs, turn them into JPEGs and export them all out, you want them ready right away. Now the camera does have two memory cards, so it's possible to set the camera up to shoot RAWs to one card and JPEGs to the other card. That way you can separate those and work with those very quickly. And so generally speaking, I don't recommend RAW plus JPEG. It's just not right for a lot of people's workflow. However, Fuji's a little bit different in my opinion because they do a really good job making JPEG. And they can do some kind of interesting or fun things with JPEGs. And yes, I like to have fun too, despite the fact that I want to shoot the best quality images. Sometimes I like to have fun along at the same time. And so uh, you might want to shoot raw just kind of as a backup to make sure that you get the best quality image possible, but then you can play around with the JPEGs. I was goofing around the other day and I was shooting some selective color options. Uh, there were some nice flowers and they had a certain color to them and I just wanted to do something kind of funky and I just, I like what Fuji does straight in the camera and I wanted to have that JPEG, but I also wanted the raw in case I just wanted a straight image that I could work with later on. And that is something that you can actually turn on just individually for a photograph or two and then turn it back into a regular mode of just shooting raw, for instance. But uh, those are the different options in there. Everybody shoots their camera a little differently, but best quality is raw, of course. So get your camera set up the way that you like it here. Let me show you how to go in and adjust a few things in here. So let's do a little demo. Let's dive into the menu. And so once again, we have our menu over here on the left hand side, we have all these different tabs. Image quality, I think is a nice logical setting here. Image size is uh, one option, but we're actually talking about image quality here. And so if you go to the right in here, you'll see that by default, the camera is set to fine, uh, which isn't so clearly labeled here, but that's a JPEG. And normal, well, that's also a JPEG. And fine plus raw is a JPEG and a raw. JPEG and a RAW, and this is where we shoot the RAW here. And so normally I would set the camera up in this mode, although I realize that there's a lot of people who work with Fuji like their JPEGs and will just e either set it straight at JPEG, uh, usually the fine quality so that you have the best quality JPEG to work with as possible. And there's some people who like the workflow of shooting RAW plus JPEG. Um, just realize that you are going to be getting double files. You're going to be using up a little bit more space in your memory card. Just be aware of it. Nothing wrong with it. It's just that that's just part of the way it works with in that situation. And so get your camera set up, as I say, the way that you want it to, what's right for you, and then we'll be ready for the rest of the class. So there you go, folks. Those are your basics, and we're ready to get into some more serious stuff.